Today is actually the last day of our week-long prayer and fasting in CFC, right? Sunday, tomorrow, we can go back to our normal lives. Now, we have consecrated ourselves, our church, our families to the Lord this week just to pray and fast because we are asking God for several things. One, we are asking God for renewed faith. We're also asking God for a clear direction for our church. And we are also asking God for empowerment for fulfilling the Great Commission. You see, the ministry is actually a spiritual battle. It's not just fought on the physical plane. It is fought in the spiritual realm. And when you are fighting the spiritual realm, what you need is spiritual weapon, right? And for us to be able to win this spiritual war, we have to go back to the Word of God. We have to go back to prayer and to fasting. And then we will have a chance to win over these challenges before us in the spiritual realm. That's why we have consecrated ourselves in, uh, to fast for a week. Now, aside from that, we also came to fast for a week because we want God's favor upon our individual lives and families. Amen? Well, among you here, in one way or the other, join the prayer and fasting this week. Raise your hands. Okay. I won't ask if you were consistent from Monday through Sunday, but at least you participated in one way or the other. Now, actually... Fasting was very common uh, during the day of the early church. In the first centuries of the Christian church, it was very common. If they had a burden, you know, if they had a, a deep or a big a prayer concern that they want to bring before God, they would fast. They would embark on prayer and fasting just to ask the Lord to empower them, to fulfill their needs, say, heal them of their sickness, provide for their needs, or empower them for the ministry. It was very common way before in the history of the church. Nowadays, you say, oh, where our church is fasting. Many people say, wow, fasting? You're so spiritual, you know? <laughs> it's something that is no longer common today. But get this. There are Christian uh, denominations until now who are still doing this regularly. And I'm very happy because CFC, although we are very new uh, in this uh, prayer and fasting, and yet this is already our fourth time as a church to pray and fast for a week. We started this in the year 2016, January, right? And this is already the fourth time. Now, for those of you who are not yet clear about fasting, you might ask right now, what is fasting? Why are you doing this? Now, fasting is a chosen abstinence for spiritual purpose. Again, fasting is a chosen abstinence for a spiritual purpose. You abstain from certain things, and most of the time we abstain from food, in order to fulfill a spiritual purpose. Now, I am uh, very much aware that there are many people there who also fast, and yet they are not fasting for spiritual purpose. For example, uh, say a, a doctor has advised his patient to fast from certain foods because it's not doing well or it's not uh, uh, benefiting his health or it is, is detrimental to his health. That's still, in a way, fasting, abstaining from oneself from food, but that is not the kind of fasting that we are doing here. Other people embark on a fasting because they want to lose weight. Okay, in a way, that's also fasting. But again, that is not the kind of fasting that we are talking about here. Here, we are fasting or abstaining from food and other things for a spiritual purpose. Our goals are spiritual. You see, fasting is a way of sacrificing something. Everybody say, sacrificing something. Sacrificing something very important to you, like food, for a greater cause. It is also a way of showing how serious you are with your prayer concern that you are bringing before, uh, before God, so much so that you are willing to go as far as sacrificing something that is very essential to your subsistence or existence, and that is, in this case, food, right? Food is very important. If you stop eating, it's just a matter of time. You are going to die. But if you fast, this is actually what you're telling the Lord. Lord, I know that food is very important to my subsistence, to my existence. Eventually, I will die if I'm not 
uh, eat food. But Lord, I have a very deep concern in my heart. I have a very heavy burden in my heart that I am willing to sacrifice my craving for food, my need for food, just to come before you in prayer and fasting. That's the spirit. Okay? Of spiritual fasting. Now, basically, fasting is abstaining from food for a period of time. Say one night, you don't eat your dinner. Or one day, you don't eat three times or three meals. Or perhaps you may want to fast for three days, a week, or several weeks. In fact, there are some people who would fast for 40 days or even more. <laughs> I admire them. I salute them. That's a very long period of time for fasting. But people do abstain from food for a period of time in varying, at varying lengths. Now, some people fast from all food, meaning during that period of time that they have decided that they are going to fast, they will not eat anything, as in anything. They will just drink water. Still others fast from only certain foods. Say, for example, perhaps some of you here decided that during this uh, fasting week, you will not entirely abstain from food, but you will just abstain from eating meat. Okay, that's still fasting. That's actually what uh, Daniel and his friends did. In the book of Daniel, they fasted from eating meat. They just ate vegetables. That is still fasting. Now, we may also fast from certain activities, not just food. Activities that distract us from spending time with God in prayer and study of His Word. One of the things that I uh, suggested to you or encourage you to do or to fast from is to fast from social media, right? Or from movies. Because many times we say that we don't have to pray, don't have to have our time to have our devotions, only to find ourselves sitting in front of our laptop or our tablet and, you know, scrolling up and down on our Facebook for the next two or three hours. True or false? You don't have to answer. I know the answer, right? So although this is not food, this is also something that we can fast from because it is distracting us from spending time with God in prayer and the study of His Word. Okay? That is basically fasting for a spiritual purpose or reason. Now listen, all those uh, fasting is a spiritual activity, but let me say this to you. If you are not careful in the way you practice fasting or you are not careful with your motives for doing fasting, I tell you, your fasting may end up unacceptable or displeasing before God. Just because it is a spiritual activity doesn't mean that God will necessarily be pleased with it. If you are not doing it the right way, if you have the wrong motives, I tell you, the Lord is not going to accept it. Now, you might ask me, so Pastor Rich, what, what, what kind of fasting pleases God? I want to do that kind of fasting that brings glory to God, that is acceptable to God. Now, today, I'm going to share with you three descriptions, three characteristics of the kind of fasting that pleases God. Are you ready? Number one. The kind of fasting that pleases God is a fasting that seeks to please God alone. Again, the kind of fasting that pleases God is a fasting that seeks to please God alone. Everybody say, God alone. One time, the Lord Jesus Christ was teaching His disciples, and among other things, He said these words uh, to them, on fasting. Matthew chapter 6, verse 16 through 18. The Lord Jesus Christ said to His disciples, And when you fast... Do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, you anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. You see, during this time, I told you a while ago, Fasting was very popular among them, okay? Both among the Jewish people and even Christians. Now, because fasting 
as an expression of penitence or repentance included afflicting oneself or included causing oneself to suffer or to be inconvenienced or to be discomforted, during this time, many Jews not only abstained from food, but also practiced other forms of self-abasement. So when they were fasting, they were not only doing fasting or abstain from food. They were also doing other things that will make them uh, inconvenient or make them feel uh, uh, pain or uh, discomfort to show that indeed they are repenting before God. They're so humble. They're so penitent before God. Now, for example, during the time, they would not shave their beard during the period of fasting. We all know that the Jews, many Jews sported the beard, right? Although many people sported the beard and they grew their beard, and yet they were also trimming it regularly. Just like our hair. We have, we have hair, right? We grow our hair and yet we are trimming it. We don't just let it grow just about any way it likes to grow and we don't care how we look like. We don't, we don't care if we look unkept the same way with the beard during the time. They grew their beard. But during the time of prayer and fasting, many of them not only would abstain from food, but they will also grow their beard and not trim it during the period of fasting. They will not uh, shave it to show that they are really, you know, humble before God. They are repenting. They are so serious. Aside from that, many of them will also refrain from washing their clothes. So if you wear the same clothes for several days, in the end, what will happen? It'll get dirty, right? It won't look nice. Okay, they also did that in order to show penitence. Now, during the time, there was this group of uh, uh, religious people called the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees, I tell you, is a sect of uh, Judaism, uh, a group of people who are very... Uh, studious student of the law of Moses, the Torah. And they studied every law of Moses, and they were very meticulous as far as applying it to their everyday lives. And they also uh, teach other people about the law of God. They were very religious. The problem was this, however. They were self-righteous. They were doing all these things because they want to show off they want to tell the people, hey, I am spiritual, I am superior than you are, I am holy. And that's why many times during the time they would find the Pharisees, you know, while walking on the street, suddenly stopping and all of a sudden start to pray. Raise their hands to heaven and pray, oh, father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They will start to pray a long prayer in public. Why were they doing that? Can they pray alone? Can they pray in the temple? Can they pray in the house? Of course, they can do those things. But you see, they, they were show off. They want people to see them, that they are spiritual, and they want people to look up to them, call them rabbi or teachers. Now, one of the things that they were using to display their supposed uh, spirituality or piety or uh, devotion is fasting. They also fasted and prayed. And uh, specifically, when they fasted, because they want to show off, right? They project a gloomy look by disfiguring their face. How? By means of sprinkling their face with ashes and applying dirt to their face and leaving it unwashed so that people will know that they were fasting. Okay? So I can imagine them not wearing, uh, not trimming their beard, not washing their clothes, and even sprinkling ashes on their face, applying dirt to it, looking so dirty, because they want people to think, wow, this Pharisee is really serious with his relationship with God. Look at them. They're so humble. Doesn't care about how he looked like. He just wants to Worship God, to show to God that he is humble, he is repentant, he is penitent. So what's the goal for doing that? It's a self-centered goal. It's to draw attention to oneself so that people will admire them. And that was rampant during the time. But you see, Jesus saw through their hearts. 
You know, the eyes of Jesus is like an X-ray vision. He sees the hearts of people. And so he said this to them, they should rather anoint their heads and wash their face instead of doing that. <laughs> Display of piety. Look at me in verse 17. He said, but when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father in heaven who sees in secret will reward you. You see, during the time, Palestinian Jews used oil to clean and wash their face. They used oil to clean and wash their face. And aside from that, they also used oil on their heads. They anoint their, their, their heads with oil, prob probably to lubricate dry scalps. Again, the purpose is to look clean and stay clean, right? But Jesus Christ said to them, you know, don't apply dirt to your face. Don't sprinkle ashes on your face. Anoint your head with oil and wash your face. In other words, he was saying, be clean. Groom yourself. I know your purpose why you are doing that why you are applying a, a dirt to your face, why you are splinking ashes on your face. You're trying to draw attention to your spirituality so that people will admire you. That's a wrong motive. And so he tells them, you know, you groom yourself. The point of Jesus is that they won't show off to people that they are fasting. You see, fasting, this thing, it's a private thing between God and the one who is fasting. It's not meant to be displayed. Of course, there are times when we cannot uh, avoid allowing people to know that we are fasting, right? But we don't do it intentionally in order to impress them. Fasting is a private thing between, between God and you. And we should keep it to ourselves as much as possible in order to guard our own motives before God. You see, there's something about doing a spiritual thing or activity in the presence of other people. You know, when you do a spiritual activity, say fasting in front of people or pray in front of people and they, and they see it, it creates something in your heart. It tempts you to bask in the glory of that spiritual act. So that although it started as a spiritual act, you end up, if you are not careful, thinking, wow, I'm so spiritual. <laughs> right? And you start to feel superior to others. You start to think, I'm fasting, I'm praying, but they're not doing it. Why are they not doing it? They lack maturity, and so on and so forth. It happens, right? When you do a spiritual act in public, there is that temptation for you to bask in the glory of it, to pride yourself over it. And that's what the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't want us to do. He doesn't want us to fall into that temptation. And He says, so He says to us, don't show off to people that you are fasting. Keep it to yourself as much as possible. You still remember I told you? One of the things that you should abstain from is social media. And uh, before we were thinking, so how do we tell people that uh, uh, we are fasting for one week? That's why we're not on social media. Maybe they uh, want to contact us through social media. And I told you, simple. You just tell them, your friends, make a post, tell them that for a w one week, you will not check your Facebook, okay? So they should rather contact you through your cell phone numbers or your email. That's all. And I told you, don't tell them it's because you are fasting. <laughs> Why did I tell you that? Because again, our heart is deceitful. Really, really. For those of you who were tempted to say, you know what, I'm going to leave uh, Facebook. By the way, I didn't see any post there, okay? So don't, be, don't think, oh, Pastor Rich, maybe Pastor Rich saw my post. 
No, I didn't see anything. But just in case you were tempted to post or inform other people that you were fasting, I don't know if you felt something wrong in your heart during that time. In all likelihood, there was the temptation in your heart to, you know, feel proud that you are fasting. Feel proud to tell people that you are doing this spiritual act. And that is what the Lord Jesus doesn't want us to experience. Okay? So, what is the kind of fasting that pleases God? Number one, a fasting that seeks to please God alone. And when we fast in secret, God who sees it in secret, He says, is going to reward us. In the end, that's the most important thing. Number two, another description of the kind of fasting that pleases God is a fasting that results in righteous deeds. Again, the kind of fasting that pleases God is a fasting that results in righteous deeds. During the time of Isaiah the prophet, in the 8th century or 7th century BC, we see there the Israelites complaining before God. Now, you might ask me, Pastor Rich, what were they complaining about? They were complaining about, uh, they were complaining before God saying, Lord, we have been fasting before you, we have been praying, we have been sacrificing for a long time now, and yet you are not answering our prayers. Have you ever asked that question to God at some point in your life? You say, Lord, I've been faithfully reading my Bible, uh, praying, even fasting, Lord. Why is it that you are not answering my prayers? Now, the Israelites during this time, this time were not only asking God. They were complaining before God. And they said, Lord, why? Are you interested? Don't you love us anymore? Don't you care for us anymore? And they were complaining and complaining and complaining and complaining. Now, one day, God decided to answer their question through the prophet Isaiah. Now, it turned out that these people, although they were engaged in spiritual activities, but actually, God saw that they were hypocrites. Why? Because although they were fasting, praying, doing all this pious activity, pious acts, and yet they were still living in sin. They were continually oppressing their uh, servants. They were not giving them their proper wages. They were living in sin and immorality. They were not uh, helping the poor, and so on and so forth. It turned out that that was the reason why God wasn't answering their prayers. In spite of their fasting and prayers, they were hypocrites. And so, the Lord said to them through the prophet Isaiah these words in Isaiah 58, 6 to 9. Isaiah 58, 6 to 9, the Lord said through the mouth of Isaiah the prophet, Is not this the fast that I, the Lord, choose? What is it? What is the fasting the Lord uh, accepts or is pleased with. He says, to lose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will what? Answer. And you shall cry and he will say what? Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and the speaking of wickedness and so on and so forth. The reason why God wasn't answering the prayers is because they were not producing fruits of righteousness you see when we fast we're actually expressing our devotion to the lord our piety before him when we fast we are actually seeking god and his righteousness we're not just there to to bow down before him and bring our petitions to him we're not just fasting because we want the lord to answer all our prayers although that's a part of it but that's not all right that's not even foundational or essential. The essential thing is that when we fast before God, we are actually seeking Him and His righteousness. 
We're actually wanting to have a right, right relationship with God, and we are pursuing to do what is right. If we fast and we do not repent for our sins, if we do not do the necessary changes, then our fasting, I am very sorry, is unacceptable to God. He's not pleased with it. It's a useless activity before Him. But listen to this. The Word of God declares, if we bear fruits of righteousness as we fast, if we turn away from our sins as a result of our fasting, the Lord will answer our prayers. Look at me. He says here in verse 8, then shall your light break forth like the dawn, right? And your healing shall spring up speedily. Who among you are praying for your sickness? <laughs> Perhaps the reason why God is not answering your prayers is because you are still living in sin. Not all the time, okay? I'm not saying that all people who are sick and have been waiting for healing from God for a long time now are living in sin. Okay? But perhaps, in the case of other people, healing is prevented because of sin. He says here, Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. And then he shall call, and the Lord will what? Answer. And you shall cry, and he will say what? Here I am to answer your prayers. Amen? If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, and speaking wickedness. If there are fruits of repentance, the Lord will be pleased with our fasting. That's number two. Number three, the kind of fasting that is pleasing to God is a fasting that obeys the word of God. Again, the kind of ple uh, fasting that pleases God is a fasting that obeys the word of God. Oftentimes, when we spend time in prayer and fasting, something very wonderful happens. The Lord starts to speak to us in a personal way. Have you ever experienced that? You know, suddenly He starts to speak to us in a personal way. Actually, this is my favorite part of prayer and fasting. <laughs> Because I noticed during those times when I would consecrate myself to prayer and fasting, I would experience God every day, several times a day, just speaking to me in a personal way. Giving me specific word, revelation, enabling me to understand things that I used not to understand or giving me instructions in the specific areas of my life. That's why I said this is my favorite part of prayer and fasting, you know? When we pray and fast sincerely before God, many times He would give us distinct impressions. They're just impressions, but you just know they come from God very distinct. You almost feel it. You, 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 know, you just know that it's God speaking to you. And as you read this verse in the Bible, you already saw it before, but this time, during prayer and fasting, it seems like the verses are jumping out of the pages of the Bible. One thing to get your attention and, and speaking to you personally. And you just know that God is using that specific verse during the time of prayer and fasting. Or there are times when uh, we pray and fast, you know, we will have the strong burden in our hearts to do a certain thing. It burns inside. We get convicted. We just know that God is speaking to us. Or in some more supernatural uh, instances, we would hear audible voice of God from the outside or sometimes inside our head. And in still other cases, they would receive dreams and visions from God. You know, supernatural manifestations of God trying to communicate His will to us. Let me give you some examples from the Bible. In Acts chapter 13, verse 1 to 3, we see here one example. It says here, Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Nigger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manain, a member of the court of Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul, whom we later know as or call as Paul. While they were worshiping the Lord and what? 
fasting. Did you see that? While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, suddenly God through the Holy Spirit, Spirit spoke to them. Look at this. The Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. What do we see here? We see a group of believers worshiping God and fasting, and all of a sudden, boom, God, through the Holy Spirit, speaks to them. It happens, not only before, but until now. Another example can be found in Acts chapter 10, verse 1 through 16. We have two examples, actually, from this passage. Let's start with verse 1. It says here, at Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, meaning he was an officer in the army of Rome. Uh, and he was a Gentile. He was non-Jewish, but he was a devout man who feared God. He believed in Yahweh and who, uh, with all his household, he believed God, he feared God, gave alms generously to the poor people and prayed continually to God. Now, during one of those times when he was praying, this is what happened, verse 3. About the ninth hour of the day, Cornelius saw clearly in a vision, very supernatural, he saw in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And Cornelius sta stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And uh, the angel said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa. And bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel spoke to Cornelius had departed, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. What do we see here? We see here Cornelius praying, spending time with the Lord, and all of a sudden, the Lord spoke to him through an angel. Okay, that's another example. Here's another example, starting in verse 9. Uh, the, con the, the story continues. It says, the next day, after that incident uh, between Cornelius and uh, the angel, the next day, as the servants of Cornelius were on their journey, and approaching the city to meet Peter, Peter himself went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to what? Pray. Again, we see someone praying, spending time in praying. And Peter became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance, another supernatural experience and during the trance or in the trance he saw the heavens open and something like a great sheet descending being let down by its four corners upon the earth and in it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air and there came a voice to peter saying rise peter kill and eat but peter said by no means lord I am not going to eat this, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. You see, the animals inside that uh, sheet coming out of heaven were unclean animals. Animals that the law of Moses has forbidden, forbidden them to eat. We know that, right? They have clean animals, unclean animals. They were only supposed to eat the clean animals and avoid the unclean animals. So although he was already very hungry in this trance, he was still aware that, hey, those animals are unclean. They are common. We're not supposed to eat them. And so although in this vision, the voice said, you rise, Peter, kill and eat, he said, by no means, Lord, I'm not going to do it, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Verse 15. And the voice came to Peter again a second time. What God has made clean, do not call common. And this happened three times. And the thing was taken up at once to heaven. What do we see here? We see here Peter spending time with the Lord in prayer, and then again the Lord spoke to him. Okay? It happens. Now, why do God speak to us? 
Why does He speak to us? When He spends time in fasting and prayer, He speaks to us for different reasons. One, He might want to enlighten you, something that you do not understand in the Word of God or maybe in your situation in life, and then because you're spending time with Him, He is pleased to reveal Himself to you, and boom, suddenly you understand things. You understand why things are happening to you. He wants to enlighten you. Another reason why He would speak to us in prayer and fasting is He wants to comfort us, perhaps. Maybe you are in the midst of a problem, of suffering. He wants to comfort you. Or sometimes He speaks to us because He wants to encourage us or to rebuke us or to correct us or even command us to do certain things now speaking of god commanding us to do certain things i don't know about you but i am aware that some of us are just content with receiving a word from god and do nothing about it say for example we spend time in prayer and fasting and then the lord starts to speak to us and then we we receive a word from him but instead of doing something about it, especially that it is a command from God, we just sit there and do nothing. We just say to the Lord, uh, in essence, noted. <laughs> okay. Have you ever experienced, you know, talking to someone, relaying to someone a very important instruction for him to do? And you really spend time explaining to the person you have to do this because this is very important. Da 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 da, da. and uh, after you exerted effort in explaining to that person, he just says to you, "Okay, noted." What did you feel? <laughs> you like it? I really don't like that word "noted." I don't know, especially when I send text to other people and I have a very long text, I explain everything, it's very serious, very important to me, that's why I sent a long text, and then people just say, noted. Now, maybe they have their reasons, but I don't like the noted. I feel that the person is not really getting it, is not interested. Now, sometimes, without us knowing, we are giving God this kind of response. In the midst of our prayer and fasting, God tells us something to do, and we just say, noted. <laughs> and we don't do anything about it. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, listen to this. Unless we actually fulfill what the Lord told us to do in our prayer and fasting, I tell you, our prayer and fasting won't be pleasing to God. God issues commands to us for us to obey them. He doesn't give us command for nothing. He does, doesn't give to us a command just because, uh, you know, he has so much time in his hands. So he has so much time to chat with us. And he has nothing to tell us. He ran out of words or ideas to share with us. And so he just says just about anything. Oh, you do this, do that. Da, 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 da. And you just say, oh, here comes the Lord. He has nothing to say. He is bored. Lord, yeah. <laughs> Noted. No. God is a purposeful God. And in the case of God, he does, he does not talk just about any time. We want Him to speak to us. His words are very precious. And so when He decides to speak to us, specifically when He decides to command us to do something, we better listen and obey them. That's what the men or the believers in Antioch did, right? When they were worshiping and praying to the Lord, the Lord said to them, Set apart Barnabas and Saul. Or Paul. That's what they did. After praying, they consecrated them, they prayed for them, and sent them out to do the gospel work among the Gentiles. Right? In the case of Cornelius, the same thing. After receiving a command from God, he sent the people to see Peter. Peter, in the same way, after he received a communication from God, you know, he met with the Gentile, Cornelius. That was the command of God for him. God gives us commands for us to obey them, not just for us to receive them and put them on the side. One night in 1991, I was still a, uh, a teenager at the time, I attended this uh, 
simple evening worship service in a church in Pasay City. And uh, it was not a very, it's not actually a special night, regular one. No special occasion that night. And the pastor was preaching on the Great Commission. He was challenging people, you know, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Da, 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 da. Now, midway through the sermon, suddenly, I felt something strange. I started to feel that the Lord was speaking to me through the words of the preacher. Now, there were many people during the time, not just me. It's an evening service. But I just knew that God was speaking to me. So every word that came out of the mouth of the preacher, you know, just struck my heart. And I just, you know, I was convicted I, uh, in a powerful way. So that towards the end of the sermon, when the preacher started to say, who among you here wants to step out in faith and follow the Lord to become a pastor or a missionary? The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. You know what? I stood up. And with tears in my eyes, I said, Lord, here I am. I want to serve you in full-time service as a pastor or missionary. And guess what happened? I was still a teenager at the time during my college years. And yet, only a few months from that incident, I found myself enrolling in a Bible school. I had other plans. But you see, my plans should be subsumed, should come under the plans of God. He spoke. I heard it. I should obey it. And the rest is history. <laughs> that happened in 1991, 26 years ago. I don't know what God is telling you to do. Did the Lord speak to you during your prayer and fasting? Did you listen? Are you planning to obey? You should. <laughs> because God gives commands for us to obey. One morning in the year 2005, I came out of our bedroom and went straight to the window because I wanted to enjoy the beautiful view outside of our house. You see, during the time, my family and I were living in uh, the city of Dana Point in Orange County in Southern California. I was uh, serving as a pastor there. And uh, he, by the grace of God, we were living with a member of a church. She was very generous. She was living all by herself. And she allowed us to stay with her in her big house. You know, a million-dollar house located in a, a beautiful city, Dana Point, overlooking the Pacific Ocean. And around us were also mil million-dollar homes. So very beautiful place. So one morning, I, 2005, I came out of the bedroom, went straight to the, to the window and start to just view the neighborhood, the houses. Wow! I said to myself, I just love America. I just love to live here. Now, while I was saying that, all of a sudden, a voice spoke in my mind very clearly. There was a voice. And the voice said, why are you here? Now, I don't know what happened to me. I wasn't even wondering why there's a voice in my mind. I just answered. I said, uh, I'm here because I just love America. You know, this is my dream to live in America. This is my American dream and I'm just living it. Even before I could finish that answer, suddenly the voice spoke again and said, you are a pastor, and yet that's how you answer me? End of talk. No more voices in my mind. But you know what? I knew what he was trying to point out. He was trying, the voice was trying, I believe that was the voice of God. He was trying to point out to me that, hey, you are a pastor. You make decisions in life. You make plans in life according to my, your calling from me. You don't say you want to come to America, stay and live here, because you just want America, because America is beautiful. You're not supposed to make decisions in that way. You have a calling from me. You should make your decisions based on your calling. 
Boom! I tell you, you know what happened? Since that day, I couldn't sleep. I had a hard time. I got so convicted, I just lost appetite for, you know, the beauty of America. In fact, many times, you know, uh, in the middle of the night, my wife would wake up and she would notice me awake at night because I would, you know, toss and turn. She just knew that I was awake and she would suddenly speak up, would call my name, and I would be surprised. I thought I was the only one awake because I was having sleepless nights because of this conviction. So, uh, not long after... Two weeks or so after, I talked to the people in church, the officers, and said, uh, I'm going back to the Philippines. They said, oh, Pastor, why are you going back to the Philippines? I said to them, uh, the Lord is convicting me to go back to the Philippines. You see, there is this church in Davao City that has been inviting me to be their pastor. They don't have a pastor for many years now. They have people, pastors who are helping them, but they don't have a head pastor. Uh, I believe the Lord is calling me to pastor the church. The members said, oh, pastor, so you are saying that you are going back to the vow because they're this church uh, that doesn't have a pastor. I said, yes. And you're going back because you want to pastor the church so that they will now have a pastor after many years. I said, yes. And they said, but pastor, if you go back to the vow so that they will have a pastor, how about us? <laughs> we will lose our pastor. <laughs> I couldn't answer them. All I knew was that God spoke and I better obey. But I tell you, that was not an easy thing for me to do. You know, I also have a small faith, a weak faith, so to speak. I just decided to come home because I knew that God wanted me to come home, and I was afraid to disobey Him. But guess what? In my heart, I wanted to stay. I had my American dream. That was my American dream. And in fact, when I was already at the airport lounge waiting for my flight, my wife, my two daughters were all asleep. They were, we, were all so, uh, we were all tired. You know, I was there. I was still vacillating between leaving and staying. I really didn't want to come home. Not that CFC is undesirable. You know, CFC is a lovable church. But you see, I knew that coming home would mean the death of my American dream. And it was so precious to me. While I was sitting there, my wife and children we're sleeping, waiting for our flight at the lounge. I tell you, I was so tempted to call my nephew who's living in Carson City in L.A., just near the airport, and ask him to just fetch us. Or to call the, the deacon of the church who brought us to the airport and tell him, okay, uh, I'm changing my mind. Because before that, they were saying, Pastor Rich, maybe uh, you just need a vacation. In fact, uh, when I told the church that I'm coming back to the Philippines, they said, oh, Pastor Rich, uh, is there a problem with the salary? Uh, we can give you a raise. <laughs> I said, no, it's not about money. The Lord is convicting me to go back home. I was there. You know, I felt like I was being led to the slaughter because I didn't want to come home. But I just obeyed the Lord because I knew that that was the right thing to do. The Lord gives us command for us to obey, not just to say, check, noted, Lord. What is the Lord telling you during this week of fasting? Is He convicting you of a certain sin that you have to abandon? Is he telling you to do a certain thing? Or maybe he's calling you to the ministry. Whatever the Lord is calling you, listen to this. You obey. You obey. You know? You know, I have this habit of uh, uh, writing down the words of the Lord to me during my devotion time because I'm afraid that uh, I won't be able to remember them. 
You see, from time to time, I would review what I wrote there in my spiritual journal so that I, I'll, I'll be able to check whether or not I have obeyed what the Lord told me to do. Who among you here have a spiritual journal, spiritual diary? That's good. That's good. If you believe that God is speaking to you, you better write it down or risk forgetting it and not doing it. Is it a small thing that God speaks to us? No. It's not like you say something uh, to the Lord and you ask Him something and He suddenly answers you. No. Right? Many times you have to wait. But I tell you, when He speaks to us on those rare times, you better write them down and make sure that you obey them. Whatever the Lord is telling you this week, obey them. Brothers and sisters, fasting is an act that outwardly indicates that your heart is right before God. That is, that your heart seeks to please God alone, that you seek to live righteously, and that you seek to obey His word. That's what should be in our heart when we fast. Fasting is just an outward symbol of that condition of our hearts. If this is not the actual condition of our heart while we are fasting, I tell you, our fasting is unacceptable before God and God will not answer our prayers. But listen to this. God has a promise. If you fast, with the right motive. If you're fasting, produce fruits of righteousness, fruits of repentance, and then you obey what the Lord tells you during your fast. He says, He will answer your prayers. He will move to bless you. So I encourage you, brothers and sisters, have the right motive and obey the Lord during this week of fasting. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for reminding us that fasting is not just an outward act, but more importantly, you are looking at our hearts, our motives, our righteousness, our obedience to you. We pray, Lord God, that may you find us with a pure heart and an obedient heart. I pray, God, for my brothers and sisters here. Empower them to live out those things that you want them to fulfill. Convict them. Encourage them. So that they will be faithful to your commands to them. And you will grant the petitions of their hearts. Thank you so much, Lord God. We give back all the glory and the praise to your name. For we ask all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.